Today, we're looking at an atomic sandblaster, a device that ionizes gas particles, accelerates them to several kilometers per second, and slams them into an object. This technique can be used for cross-sectioning computer chips, very gently polishing optics and metal samples, and even etch the hardest substance we know of, diamond. The device is called an ion mill, and it uses a highly energetic ion beam to etch any surface you put in the way. And while the description sounds a little bit like science fiction, it's actually a pretty common instrument used in many research labs. So this is my ion mill. It's an old machine that I bought off eBay, and I've had to make a number of repairs to it. So that is the turbo pump down there under this screen. If I turn the thing on, it should start spinning up. But it's not. But I finally have it working, and I thought folks might want to see what it can do. It looks complicated, but that's just because there are some weird design choices on this particular instrument. It's actually a pretty straightforward device. There's a vacuum chamber here, which holds your sample. A rough vacuum pump and a turbo molecular pump both work to bring the chamber down to a high vacuum level. The sample is supposed to sit on a stage that both rotates and rocks back and forth, but mine is missing that. So it just sits on these little cylinders of metal that I made. The sample is loaded in, and a shield is rotated to temporarily cover the sample. In the top of the chamber is an ion gun, which generates a beam of ionized particles and is responsible for the etching. We'll talk more about the ion gun in just a second. Now, under normal operation, the top ion gun shoots straight down onto your sample and begins to etch it. But that's kind of hard to see in the video, especially with this tiny little viewport. So I built a secondary viewport which goes onto the front of the chamber, and it gives a better view of these two other ion guns that are on the machine. Technically, these guns are used for depositing material rather than etching, but they work the same as the etching gun, and it's just a lot easier to see. So all the footage will be showing those guns rather than the top ion gun. Depending on how you configure the machine, you can get anywhere from a very gentle polishing effect all the way up to very aggressive etching. And if you're a little too aggressive with it, you can accidentally blast holes straight through your sample. So how exactly does all this work? An ion gun accelerates a beam of ionized particles at your target. Argon is typically used because it's inert and doesn't interact with your sample. Inside the gun, there are only a few components. There's an anode surrounded by an insulator at the very center. This in turn is surrounded by some magnets. And finally, there's a cathode which forms the outer shell. Argon is emitted into the chamber's interior, and a high voltage potential is applied between the anode and the cathode. Because this is under vacuum, we can apply anywhere from 2 to 10 kilovolts of potential before a discharge happens. The electrons try to jump from the anode to the cathode, but the magnets force them to spiral and oscillate in the gap between the two. This gives the electrons more time to impact an argon molecule that's floating through the gun. This in turn ionizes the argon and causes them to accelerate towards the cathode. Finally, they're ejected and travel in a straight line until they hit something. This simple process gives the argon a tremendous amount of kinetic energy. Each argon atom is traveling at several kilometers per second. A particle leaves the gun and hits the sample in less than 50 microseconds. The argon particles basically turn into an atomic sandblaster, impacting the surface and physically removing the material atom by atom. I made some simulations to help explain how this all works, but please note that these are not real scientific simulations. It's just Newtonian physics and blunder, and I tweaked the settings until it approximated what's actually happening. So just, you know, keep that in mind. The argon particles are in blue, and the sample is in yellow. As the argon hits the surface, we can see a few things happening. First, the argon either bounces off without doing anything, bounces into the interior of the sample and gets kind of stuck there, or it knocks free an atom of the sample. Over time, and with enough argon impacting the surface, a small crater is formed. This process is known as sputtering, and it's basically how we etch the surface of the sample. If we change how fast the argon is being accelerated, we can change the depth and size of the crater, because more speed of the particles means more kinetic energy, which is transferred into the sample. In all the simulations, you can see argon being embedded into the sample. This actually happens in real life, and it's one of the reasons argon is used as opposed to a different gas. 
The process is called implanting, and it's generally an unwanted side effect. If you used a gas that's reactive in some way, some of those implanted atoms might actually bond to your sample chemically and alter it, which is not what you want. Another interesting thing to note is the sample itself. You can see that the etching process messes up that nice crystalline matrix of the sample. This is known as amorphization and can be problematic depending on what you're doing. The semiconductor field, for example, will often perform a thermal annealing step afterwards to help recrystallize and heal the damage. There are a ton of other variables you can play with too. For example, changing the angle of impact can drastically alter how a material is etched. And you can place physical masks in the way to get a partial etching effect. For simplicity here, I modeled the mask as a solid material, but of course it's made of atoms too, and it will also be etched by the ion beam. So you need a mask that's thicker than the depth you want to etch, or else you'll just etch right through the mask itself. To demonstrate this in practice, I etched some of these microchips that were kindly donated to the channel by a viewer. A thin piece of titanium shim stock was used as a mask, and it was etched in the machine for about an hour. <laughs> and goodness, does this look really cool under the microscope. We can see a very clearly defined etch line, and zooming in, we can basically see like a cliff or a wall where the mask hid the material from the ion beam. I was etching very aggressively to remove material quickly, so we can see that the etch region is filled with like craters and pock marks. In some places, there's a large blob of material, and this is actually aluminum that melted and then balled up. The ion etching process can generate an extraordinary amount of heat, simply from the argon impacting the sample. It's a lot of kinetic energy that is being dissipated into the sample, and because it's in vacuum, there's no air to help draw the heat away. If you're not careful, you can get samples up to a glowing red heat, which in this case was enough to melt the aluminum. We can also see these little spikes scattered all around. There's almost always a bright dot at the top of that spike, and that bright dot is a tungsten via from the semiconductor chip. Ion milling will etch all materials, but it will etch some materials slower than others. Tungsten is pretty resistant to ion etching, so it's removed a lot slower than the surrounding silicon and aluminum. The tungsten acts as a tiny little mask, protecting the material directly below it, and we're left with these spikes. If we go back to the cross-section, we can get a glimpse inside the chip itself. And this is actually one of the main uses of ion milling, is to create nice, clean cross-sections for microscopy. The element detector shows us aluminum interconnects, tungsten vias, thin films of titanium used as adhesion layers, and a layer of nitrogen on top. At first, I thought the nitrogen was just contamination, but if we look around the top of the chip, we can see nitrogen everywhere except the bonding pads. So I'm pretty sure this is actually a silicon nitride passivation layer applied to the top of the chip, which is, I don't know, it's pretty cool to see. For these microchips, I just used a piece of shim stock as the mask, but there's nothing preventing us from making more complicated stencils. For another test, I created a pattern using electron beam lithography and deposited about 100 nanometers of aluminum, then etched that inside the machine. The results are far from perfect, but we can see that the deposited metal acted as a mask and helped protect the material below it, just like the tungsten vias that we saw earlier. Using this technique, researchers can create etch patterns at a microscopic scale, often in materials that are difficult to etch with wet chemicals. Ion milling can also be used for polishing instead of aggressive etching. This is used, for example, in ultra-precision optics, basically as a way to fix nanometer-sized errors on telescope mirrors and lenses. It's a way to make adjustments that would be hard or even impossible to do with traditional polishing techniques. More commonly though, it's used in labs to help prepare samples for a microscope. In the past, I've tested metal 3D printing filament, which requires a sintering step. And to see how well it sinters, you have to cut it open and take a look at it. So for that, I physically sanded it using first sandpaper and then diamond slurry. And we can see that the surface is, you know, it's fine. It definitely gave me all the information I needed to debug the process. But you can still see scratch marks, even though I was using very small diamond abrasives. But a few minutes in the ion mill with very gentle settings was enough to smooth out some of those scratches. It's not perfect, and a professional with a modern machine could do a lot better. But it does show how gentle ion milling can be. And finally, ion milling is useful because it just 
doesn't care about the material that you're etching. Some materials will etch faster or slower, but they will all get etched given enough time. And that includes some of the hardest materials we know of, including diamond. I took one of these little diamond particles and etched it with the mask in place for a couple hours. And if we look at it under the microscope, we can see there is definitely an etch line there. Considering how long it was under the beam, and that we only etched a few microns, it's a very slow process, but we definitely etched the diamond. Which is honestly pretty amazing if you think about it. Diamond is typically ground and polished with other diamonds. That ends up being extremely slow and very expensive, because your abrasive wears out at the same rate as the thing you're trying to abrade. In contrast, an iron mill slams individual argon gas particles into the diamond at such high speeds that it knocks carbon atoms free. It's kind of remarkable when you think about it. It truly is an atomic sandblaster, capable of etching any material. As I mentioned at the beginning, this instrument required a fair amount of work to get running. I had to troubleshoot the rough vacuum pump, the turbo molecular pump, the gas input valve, the cold cathode gauge, the high vacuum power supply, and the actual ion guns. A month ago, this machine was a black box. Oh, of course now it's been up. Of course the time I film it fixes itself, I swear. And I had no idea what was wrong. But you just tackle it one problem at a time until you figure it out. It can be kind of daunting at first, but problem solving is a skill like anything else. And the best way to improve a skill is through practice, which is exactly what Brilliant.org is great at. At its core, Brilliant teaches math, computer science, and programming using fun and interactive lessons. But more generally, Brilliant teaches you how to solve problems. Today you might be learning how to code, and tomorrow you might be debugging an unreliable cold cathode vacuum gauge. The ability to tackle any problem quickly and efficiently, even if you don't have any experience with it, is invaluable. With Brilliant, you can learn classical mechanics, electricity and magnetism, or how large language models work. And in the process, hone your problem solving skills. Courses are taught through interactive, bite-sized lessons. You learn at the pace that works for you, and on topics that are becoming increasingly important in today's job market. The truth is, AI and automation are continuing to take over low-level tasks, which means it's up to the humans to do the hard stuff, like programming and working on big problems. So if you'd like to improve your problem-solving skills while learning a little quantum computing on the side, I recommend giving Brilliant a try. You can get started with a free 30-day trial, and the first 200 signups will also get 20% off an annual plan at brilliant.org slash breaking taps, or just follow the link in the description down below. Big thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video and just the channel in general. They've sponsored videos in the past, and I'm legitimately always happy to promote their service because it's a great example of how interactive learning should be done. Well, I think that's all. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.